Hello, welcome to the official Spotlight podcast. My name is Simon Lipscomb and thank you very much for listening. In today's conversation, we're turning to issues of supply chain and supplier relationship management. And specifically, we're going to be talking about issues connected to supply chain cybersecurity. According to a UK government report in 2016 about security breaches, very few UK businesses set minimum security standards for their suppliers. And that's at the same time where there have been a series of very high profile and damaging attacks from companies um, that have demonstrated that attackers have both the intent and the ability to exploit vulnerabilities in the supply chain. Uh, So this is definitely a trend that is growing. It's a real threat and it's increasingly a topic that procurement and supply chain professionals need to understand. So today I'm joined by David M. David is Principal Security Researcher at Kaspersky, a provider of security and threat management solutions. David joined Kaspersky in 2004. He is a member of the company's global research and analysis team and has worked in the anti-malware industry since 1990 in a variety of roles, including Dr. Solomon Software and McAfee. So David, thank you so much for joining me today. Delighted to have this chance to have this conversation with you. Maybe we could start by just outlining what we mean when we talk about cybersecurity risks in supply chains. I mean, effectively, when we talk about a supply chain attack, we're talking about a violation of trust somewhere in your chain of suppliers. So, you know, we know that there is a sort of vast interconnection of different companies within the marketplace at any given time. And it may be that a company is producing an overall product, but actually other suppliers are contributing to that. They're providing particular aspects of the manufacturer, let's say, and they're responsible for that. So that the overall product is made up of different bits and other companies are involved somewhere in that manufacturing process. Now, it could be software software, it could be a physical device, it it could really be anything. But the issue really with, I guess, the supply chain attack and focusing on that is that companies have direct control over their own processes and their own procedures and their own policies. But they have much more limited control over the same with companies that they do business with. And if they're not giving some attention to that, then the potential is that other company in their supply chain then becomes a weak point, which allows entry by an attacker into their company. Understood. So when we talk about supply chain security, so we're talking about people that are using a supplier of another company to get to to potentially to that company. So it's kind of jumping across the supply exactly. chain. Exactly. Yeah, they're stepping stones, basically. They, the attacker is using those companies in your supply chain as a stepping stone for getting to you. And David, just to put that in context, I mentioned in the intro there have been a number of very high profile attacks recently that have come from this route. It'd be quite helpful if you wouldn't mind just maybe talking us through some of those. I'm sure people will recognise the names, but maybe not so much the connection. There have been some quite high profile ones over the last few years, actually. One that people, I think, might remember very clearly is something called Expetra or Not Petra, which was back in 2017. And this was basically where the attackers compromised an automatic update system for a particular accounting package called ME Dot. And they used this to deliver ransomware to all of the customers of that software package. And it ended up with millions in losses because, of course, although that package was was used primarily in a particular geographical location, it only required companies to be connected or have a point of contact within that geographical region in order for their networks to be compromised as well. And so some big names, you know, Maersk, for example, a huge shipping giant, estimated yeah. that it cost about $250 million. TNT Express estimated the cost at about $300 million to their bottom line. So we're talking here about significant impact in terms of financial cost. But in some ways, an obvious question, but worth checking. Who are the people instigating these attacks? And ultimately, what, what are they doing it for? I presume financial gain. Yeah, I mean, it can vary. I mean, in the case of Expetra, it turned out it wasn't a classic ransomware attack where they were looking to make pots and pots of money, but rather, actually, it was in effect a wiper. In other words, it was being used to cause damage to systems. But that isn't always the case. It could be to cause disruption. And clearly with a ransomware attack, the, the ultimate goal is actually to make money. Uh, yeah. That's that's really what their purpose in life is. It's not necessarily the case that it's always ransomware. I mean, another of these attacks known as solar winds, again, it targeted software, in this case, a solution for monitoring and managing IT infrastructure, and it was compromised with a a custom backdoor, which was deployed on the networks of about 18,000 of their customers, some of them very large corporations, government bodies across the globe. And it's likely that the ultimate targets were probably not 18,000 companies, 
but it, they cherry picked from that to get to those particular organizations. So it could be part of a targeted campaign, which yeah. could, of course, be to grab intellectual property, or it could be for geopolitical reasons. It could be plainly to make money. Yeah. And obviously, as, as recognized industry experts in this space, are you expecting to see more of these types of sophisticated attacks? I think so. I mean, you know, it's always difficult to make firm predictions, but we've certainly seen this grow over the last few years as a, a technique. And I think, you know, criminals and other attackers, all kinds of attackers actually are always on the lookout for what might be an easy way in, which is why actually from very sophisticated nation state sponsored attacks right through to what you would call opportunist cybercrime, looking to get your bank credentials or mine. Yeah. The starting point is quite often hacking individual humans, so to speak. So tricking us into doing something that jeopardizes our corporate security. So they're always on the lookout for an angle and clearly looking at suppliers, they're discovering that that can be actually quite a, a productive angle from their point of view. Two questions. First one, have you found that the, I suppose the recent COVID area of more people working from home, has that increased the threat? level to your point humans are potentially the first point of weakness has that made all of this more complicated and hard i would say that COVID has had an impact both from an individual point of view and from a corporate point of view on the one hand what what it's provided is a topic of vital interest to everyone across the globe which is persistent so when fishers people who are trying to persuade us to click on things normally you know they'll pick a topic like the world cup or the euros or the olympics or some natural disaster and it's sort of here today gone tomorrow as a topic and they're yeah. on to the next one. COVID now has been with us for 18 months or more, and therefore it, it's persistent. And it's given them an opportunity to milk every aspect of that from, you know, government support to tax breaks, to delivery companies sending stuff, to information about the vaccine. There's yeah. a never-ending supply of aspects of COVID that they're tapping into. So that's one side. The other is, of course, that many of us have been pushed into working from home. And therefore, we're not sitting behind that defensive wall, so to speak, that our IT departments would, would have in place when we're in the office. Yeah. And rather, you know, there was an initial rush to ensure business continuity last March and April. You know, yeah, use whatever kit you can, get connected to the network any way you can, and then a sort of sigh of relief once you know that you're still in business and things are productive. But of course, it introduces potential dangers because IT departments can't necessarily control all the equipment in the way that they could with their own computers, certainly within the office. You know, it's it's no surprise, for example, that in the wake of the lockdowns, we saw a spike in attempts by attackers to gather credentials for corporate servers, let's say for remote desktop servers, those servers used to manage our remote connections because they were hoping that they weren't all protected with good passwords and therefore yeah. they could get access to them and use that as a stepping stone into the organization. So COVID definitely has had a, an impact in kind of perhaps loosening some of the controls that were in place by IT departments. And is it also true that this topic is becoming more pertinent because increasingly, particularly within supply chains, products or things that we would buy both as individual and as organizations are, have more you know, online capability, more kind of inherent you know, software in them, cars, fridges, thermostat. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, technology and connectivity are now woven into the fabric of our lives, sometimes quite literally. You know, if you think of smart tags and things like this, or you think of home assistants in people's living rooms, or you think about smart meters, or as you said, cars, CCTV cameras, and with 5G being rolled out, that's making connectivity even more ubiquitous. And therefore we sort of have, or we're approaching a sort of almost on society. And therefore there is more opportunity because the more types of endpoint there are, and the more of them that there are, that's more potential points of contact and more potential avenues for exploitation by an attacker. And David, given all of these headwinds, are you seeing more and more organisations looking to put in place processes or systems to protect their supply chains? Or do you feel that's still an area that needs an awful lot of work and improvement? I think it's changing. I think people are beginning to realise that it's an important aspect of security. Yeah. Um, we still hear about attacks, not just supply chain attacks, where you think, well, you know, why wasn't somebody kind of looking at that? Or why weren't they considering this aspect? So we know that in security, generally, things can get overlooked. But I think supply chains is in an area of particular concern because it's being exploited more, yes. but also because it's not necessarily obvious in the way that something directly under your control is. At the end of the day, I suppose 
in our individual lives. You know, if we employ a nanny or we want our kids to go to a nursery or something like that, you know, we tend to do our research and check them out and make sure that we're comfortable with them. But it's not always apparent if you're doing business with somebody that you need to do that. I mean, clearly you're looking maybe at their financial credibility and other things like that. But of course, not necessarily thinking of it in terms of the points of connection you've got technologically. And as I say, it could be anything from somebody who is providing, let's say, a custom script on your website to collect payment information. Uh, We've seen those compromised in the past. Or it could be software that you're using and the attackers have managed to implant some malware into an update to that software so that you think you're just updating an application, but actually you've just installed a piece of malware. Or indeed, it could be that somebody manages to infiltrate a supplier and they have a connection, a direct connection, let's say, to part of your network because of the work that they're doing. And therefore, they they get in that way through a a sort of direct hacking attack. So, you know, there's any number of ways in which it can happen. But I think what organizations need to start looking at is to say, well, we need to actually audit our systems and work out where the risks are. But that has to include people who are providing some kind of service or product to us to decide whether that's something that we need to take into account. And that's not saying don't do business with anyone else what it's saying is that by understanding what the level of risk is you then make a decision about you know is it a risk we can mitigate is it a risk that we need to mitigate in terms of its potential impact and then look at what you can do about that you know when you look at your own risk assessment you look at what have we got what's been held on it who has access to it how might a third party an attacker get access to something what might the long-term impact of that be and so on it's just a question of saying well what suppliers do we have what needs to be protected what is the risk? You know, what is the point of connection? Where does the risk occur? And evaluate what their security posture is. I guess two sides to this, Simon, in the sense that as a maybe a large organization, I maybe want to check my supplier's security. But equally, if I'm a smaller company looking to be part of somebody else's supply chain, I need to be thinking about my own processes in order to be able to reassure a potential customer that actually we're a safe pair of hands to do business with. For a small or medium sized organization where maybe they don't have in-house experts, they don't have maybe years of experience dealing with IT or with security, they may kind of wonder, well, where do we go? And one great first point of contact for an organization in that position is the government's cyber essentials scheme, right. where they will identify, you. here are the major areas you need to think about in your organization. And then beyond that, it may be that, you know, you want to go a step further and get certified, cyber essentials certified, so that you can show a potential partner yeah. that actually you've thought about security yourself the audience that will listen to this podcast is probably predominantly procurement and supply chain people so it sounds like this is just another form of supplier relationship management supply due diligence right and as you say in the way that you would check a supplier's financials to make sure they're not going to go bust maybe in the future it's equally important if not more important that you're checking their cyber credentials yeah absolutely you know and also making sure the staff of a large organization is clued in because you know what even down to things for example as getting calls from a supplier asking you to take some action and yeah. making sure that's not fraudulent. So having a process in place which says, well, actually, one person can't sign off a change of bank account if somebody rings up telling us we need to do that or, you know, make a payment. It's looking at the processes so that you're managing the points of potential risk. Yeah. And David, just looking forward a little bit, what do you see the threat landscape looking like? Do you see it changing? The specialists in this world, where's your focus going forward? It's interesting because, you know, if we look back over the, the last few decades, we've seen sort of waves of developments which have changed the threat landscape. I mean, until around about 2003-04, we would have been saying that nearly all malware out there was just cyber vandalism. Yeah. Not that it's not damaging, because it could be. There was no kind of financial payoff, because let's face it, we weren't using the web to conduct transactions and move money around. They were the shop front for showing people our wares. Within a few years of that, it changed to being nearly all financial cybercrime. And then we got a wave, another wave with mobile computing, when the business environment changed and we weren't any longer just sitting in an office with, with a work computer, but, you know, we could be anywhere at any time doing business. And I think the next wave that we're kind of in the midst of, really, is the whole Internet of Things change. In other words, yeah. where we've yeah. seen computing reduced down to everyday objects that in the past would not have been computer controlled, but they are now. And therefore, it, it sort of expands that circle of potential risk, really. Yeah. David, thank you so much for that conversation. It's, it's been incredibly enlightening, certainly for me, not an area that I need to much about but I think that was really helpful my pleasure Simon when we post this podcast we'll have a link through to your company
company's website. I'm not speaking on your behalf, but I'm sure if people have questions, you will be okay for, for them to contact you. Sure. But as I say, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. Thanks a lot. If you enjoyed this podcast, please click the follow button on your chosen podcast platform. We'd also absolutely love to hear your views. So please do leave us a review on those platforms or indeed send me a message on LinkedIn. And we'll be back soon for another discussion with senior industry figures.